Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a native. I'm going to talk about from Ballymont to Bogota under the theme of Get Digital. Uh, thank you to all the guys in, in Get Digital for asking me to speak. I grew up across the road in, in Papin's Road. Um, many of you know that very well from buying your uh, chicken wrap salads or whatever else you have across the way in the corner there. But we're now located up in Kulak, up in Clonshop Industrial Estate. That is the, for many of you who are sitting watching Netflix or streaming at nighttime, that's actually where the internet in Ireland pretty much lives. The cables come from North America, along the Atlantic seabed, around Donegal, and around Wexford, and come in at Sutton Cross and Balloyd. So most people don't know that there's engineering students here. We have this fantastic submarine cable system coming in to Kulak. So in North Dublin is the epicenter of the internet in Ireland, where all the big brands connect to. My relationship with DCU goes back many, many years, and uh, even my, my eldest son is, uh, is a student here at DCU, so I've had a strong connection over the years with DCU, having lived here and engaged with the university over the years. Our ambition, and I'm going to talk a little bit and weave in the themes that the guys asked me to look at, which is uh, looking at uh, Industry 4.0, privacy, and the future of work. A little bit of background to put some context on Magnet, who we are and what we're about. I think key is, um, that's not coming up on screen here, there you go, um, our vision, it's a rather large vision which is to be the best B2B telecommunications company in the world. We don't have small ambition, we want to win big. Ireland is a very small market, that's one of the things when I, when I think about the future of work is when you have an idea for a business and looking at an enterprise, you've got to think outside of Ireland. I was in Mumbai two weeks ago and talking with companies there, and you're talking about other, a city in Mumbai of 23, 24 million people. If you really want to scale in the get digital space, it's about get digital, go global. Right? One of the thematic things I talk about with my team, which is a huge shift. Those of you studying business organizational change to take a company that was based in North Dublin and now talk about Bogota, talk about Mumbai, that is a big transformation for an organization. The types of uh, services we provide, uh, Anne pointed out some of the things like smart cities. So brands you may be familiar with like the X Factor, um, NFL games in smart cities. We have a major smart city project in London and we're working on projects in India, in the Middle East and in uh, Latin America more recently. Global connectivity, uh, we provide connections to companies around the world so at this very time when I use the phrase in Bali, Monte, Bogota, we are connecting Irish businesses with broadband and we're connecting businesses in Costa Rica, in Istanbul, in Tel Aviv. It's an Irish company, you go back to the vision, which is to be the best B2B telecoms company in the world. Not the biggest, not the, same, not the biggest, but the best. And types of the companies that we work with who trust us, some of the brands that you recognize there and some of the TV brands like MTV and some growing companies, fantastic Irish stories like Stay City. A very, very good, uh, great organization expanding the global ambition also. In terms of what we do and what we, we choose, um, the lines of that, the discipline of market leaders, what we focus on is customer engagement. Fiber optic in our industry, anybody can have fiber optic. What sets an Irish company apart and sets Irish companies, and I've lived in the US and lived in Europe, is our ability to communicate openly, uh, our ability to engage in an empathetic way, People in, and organizations around the world have a huge respect for Irish and Irish culture, and that's something helping us win on a global stage against much, much bigger brands. So, just coming to uh, the topic of uh, future work, it's global. And I studied in Ireland uh, years ago and studied business studies, and I did accounting. I'm not an engineer, I'm an accountant. Um, for me, uh, back then, it was about where do, you, where do you build a career, how do you expand? and. I actually took myself off, like many of you will, or some of you already have done and come back, is I went off to the UK and I went to the States and I built my international experience. And it's the one piece of advice I have, and it's one critical thing for success, you've got to think global. 1.3 billion people in India, and in that context, 183 million people in India are at the same economic level as the average Irish person is. We have to transform our thinking about the future of work. It is not just about an Irish story. We are competing on a global stage, and it's not just about the US. Take your business to the US and go big there. It is about going big and going global, going east, the Middle East, Africa, looking at Asia, Asia Pacific. Um, this will give you a sense of, when I set out the ambition to take Magnet on a global stage, we had one location, which was really the office was based here in Ireland. Um, we then subsequently grew up to two. We're now in 87 cities around the world. 
and our plan, the business plan, is going to be through 300 locations. So I think of that as a challenge, 300 locations to be serviced digitally. That's providing customers with services, whether they are a large Irish multinational that wants to set up in Singapore, or whether it's a company building a large smart city complex in Buenos Aires, which we're talking about at the moment. But as, a, as a, an ambition, it is very much a global ambition, and the team and people that work for Magnet, we become a 24 by 7 organization. So when you think about it, we saw the earlier slides about the organization, we need languages, absolutely critical language skills technical skills, because the jobs that Anne mentioned, you know, that don't exist today, we're heavily involved in data analytics. Whether it's at the toll booths in Mumbai, or today in Mumbai, people click the cars that go through, they count the cars manually. Three people are employed at the toll booth in Mumbai, about 80 people counting cars. There's artificial intelligence now on CCTV that will do that automatically for you. The world is changing, right? So from an ambition perspective, in the shape of work, the future work environment to me is a global a multilingual and a highly skilled place to be in, and you have to be mobile. That's kind of a representation of where some of our uh, customers are and some of our locations. We're opening in Australia uh, later, or sorry, early in uh, 2019, and we're looking at Hong Kong and uh, Singapore from a location build perspective in Q2 of next year. So we have gone global in a fairly short space of time from an Irish company to a global platform. What is it that we've, that we've taken? One of the solutions when you think about product has been uh, GDAS, Global Deployment as a Service. So we were thinking about it, and I was thinking about how do you define what we do? How do we stand out on the global stage? Agility, our ability to communicate, engagement with the customer, the passion for the customer is at the core of what we do, living and breathing it. So to think global, we also have to assist our clients and our customers locally. And that's the phrase, the global deployment as a service. We can take any company and provide them live cybersecurity, data connectivity, telecom services anywhere in the world. And I mean literally mean anywhere. We're working with a customer right now in the Central African Republic using satellite technology to give them a higher broadband connection in the middle of the jungle. So that is the thinking we've had to adopt to be successful. The Irish market is too constrained. As a regulatory environment, it is not so conducive to what we do. So we've had to look for a global perspective as how we take this business and succeed in growth. Um, another example is when you think about an opportunity for Irish businesses and how you expand is, think of all the Irish businesses now located in the west coast of the US, just as an example. The names many of you are familiar with have studied. What is it that you can do to engage with those organizations? What about all of the US organizations based here? How can you engage and help them? I've worked in, in California, Silicon Valley, and the one thing that typically US organizations don't like is to take themselves beyond Western and English speaking Europe. And in a post Brexit world, what does it mean when you have a unique opportunity as the only English speaking nation in the European Union that you can leverage that with the US organizations? You can be their trusted advisor, their consultant, and engage with those organizations in Asia, Pacific, and Latin America. I've lived in the US, I've seen how that happens, and that's what we're doing here in Ireland. But it's not just the US, because that's often talked about, go to the US. Asia is a massive opportunity. Again, think of the stats, 1.3 billion people in India, 183 million people of an average income or higher than the average Irish person. Huge, huge opportunity. You need to change your thinking. We had to, as an organization, change our mindset for a global stage. That's the future of work for us and the future organization. Um, some points about Asia, the opportunities I see it. It is going to be the Asian century. The demand in India for smart cities, they want to build a hundred smart cities. Put some numbers on it, I just spoke to one of your professors of, uh, of accounting across in the business school, and he asked, how big is the business pipeline? So the total construction value in the Middle East right now of projects we're working on is $1.5 trillion. Right? They're just mind-blowing numbers. The investment in smart cities, in artificial intelligence and data analytics, back to what I said about the jobs that don't exist now, that will exist in years to come. Those are coming, right? But the opportunity from an Irish perspective is our ability to be agile. We have a level of endurance. We are, as a nation, we've tended to emigrate quite a lot, so we have a very open mindset. So the opportunity is to engage in that global stage. Second element, power of digital. This was uh, the, the project that was mentioned about Wembley Stadium. When you watch, if you do happen to watch it, and are uh, sick of watching it, X Factors and things like that, for NFL games, this is Wembley Stadium. This was just one giant car park. And I'll show you, this was five, six years ago when I engaged and built a joint venture in London with a very large construction company. It gives you a sense of, from a smart city perspective, 
what we're doing, and if I just expand, so think of people coming out of a tube station, just envision you walking out to see a concert or a football match, we're analyzing who you are, the spatial recognition technology capturing who you are, where you walk to within that environment. Our joint venture partner gets paid rent as a percent of turnover, so we can drive with digital marketing people into the shop, their revenue goes up. A lot of people go, so what about big data? The so what is actually you can help lift the top line of a business. You can also help lower costs. The way we deploy network technology here takes about 60% of the cabling cost out of the building. Because you don't have to run as many cables. Nearly everything now, most of you will have your laptops, your devices, etc. You're not plugging into something. Key elements in the smart city space, that's the market size projected, 2.6 trillion. So when I talk about just an element of industry, 4.0 is what is the opportunity in that sector. It is a vast sector. India building 100 smart cities. A company I met in India, Reliance Geo, uh, we talk about the national broadband plan here. You heard it in the news. And we're talking about rolling out to 500,000 homes. I asked them and I met them in Mumbai, and their plan is they're currently rolling out fiber optic technology to 300 million homes. So the scale is vastly different. This is an example, this is a real live example of a heat map on, on match day. This was actually the FA Cup final. Um, we were tracking where people were, how they moved. On the top right hand slide, you might be able to work out the Nike factory store. There's the Adidas store. So we were able to, to work out the middle heat map at the top, that's the Arsenal fans, and the one on the right is the Chelsea fans. We were able to work out with the property owners which fans spent more money. Because we were able to track which fan zone they were, they went to the Chelsea fans on, or Arsenal fans on, and which shop they went into. So again, thinking about that kind of data and the power of that data, and we'll come on to the privacy issues, but we can monitor those. The, the X factor, when those things are happening, we can see who is there. They log in with their Facebook profile, what type of thing are they doing, why are they here, how often have they been here. We're able to link your number plate in your car, your apartment number, your facial recognition. It's kind of Orwellian almost in terms of that data. And with that comes a huge level of responsibility in capturing that level of information. This was just a, a slide on, on India. This is public information, gives you a sense of the scale of it. They're actively now rolling out the smart city plan in India to uh, 100 cities. Uh, the Middle East is 30. Other opportunities when you're thinking about it, people like Microsoft doing the underwater data centers, is what, you know, in terms of industry 4.0, how are we looking to address the, uh, the cost agenda with technology? If you have a data center under the water, you don't need to cool it. The water keeps it cool. That's a live experiment now off Scotland, and that's working. Um, you have issues which we're working with the Irish Marine Development Organization and also DCU involved with Water Institute, is autonomous shipping. So if you go onto the Rolls-Royce website, those of you who have drones and practice with drones, you're now controlling ships in, in Copenhagen using autonomous remote control. That is the future of shipping. Of course, that opens up issues around cybersecurity if the ship is attacked. Merce, the big shipping line, it cost them close to 450 million was the cost of their most recent cyber attack. 450 million was the cost of a cyber attack on a shipping company last year. That was the Pepia virus, I think, in 2017. Another element I think is just, there's a lot of talk about digital. I'll bring it back to people buy from people. So if there's a few words of advice for me as somebody in business for, for 26 years is about the product. I talked about picking something like you know, the traditional four P's of marketing, and I've got different P's here and that one, but it's the people. People buy from people. You still need, particularly when you're selling to large customers, building relationships is critical. Irish people are great at building relationships. The partnership is something vital. If you're entering a new market, industry 1.0 to industry 4.0, if you're going to expand to a new market and go global, partnerships are the only way you can do that. You cannot enter the Middle East or Saudi Arabia market on your own. You need somebody locally, the same for India, the same for Latin America. Uh, persistence, endurance, you will get knockbacks. In sales, you will get plenty of no's, but the more no's you get, the more yes's you're likely to get. That's the golden rule in sales. Be prepared to take that path less traveled. It is not going to be easy. You will get fails many times, and you've read about it and heard about it, fail fast, fail forward. Make that mistake, pick yourself up and move on. That is my firm belief. And you will spend lots of time on planes. Whether some of you end up working in aircraft leasing, but you're going to spend lots of time on planes, trust me. In terms of my own personal experience of partnership, I did two things in my life. One was on Everest, uh, climbing Mount Everest, and the other was last year swimming the channel. Right? I couldn't have done that with that partnership. The partnerships being the Sherpas, and the partnership of going across the channel last September was a pilot of 45 years. There were 400 ships going up and down the channel every day. And if I didn't have a pilot, I would have run over. 
But you have to tell me to avoid because it was a tanker coming down towards you. So you'd change course as you're swimming because you would get run over by a tanker. So as you enter the market, partnerships is something I've always been keen to me is climbing something like Everest, you need Sherpas, experienced people. Swimming the channel, you need experienced pilots who can show you the way, ease your path of entry. Do not go alone entering new markets. So in that context, using people like Enterprise Ireland, Invest Hong Kong, the Irish organization Asia Matters, I just come from the session. And then partnerships in region like Tata. We're engaging right now with Tata in the UAE on a major smart metering project, about 700,000 homes in, in, in uh, the Middle East. And on the Sri Group, a very large infrastructure group in India. On to my final topic is privacy, trust, and governance. So I've given you a whistle stop tour of, we've talked about going global. I've talked about some, some of the topics and things we do in smart cities and the wealth of data that we're capturing. And probably with that comes to me, probably the most important thing as a, as a CEO and director is the responsibility that we have with all of your information. If you're a magnet customer, a residential customer, a business customer, you're relying on us 24 seven to keep you safe, keep your data safe from prying eyes. We're also gathering a huge wealth of information. And the topic and the phrase we coined a couple of years back was cybernomics. And so I was trying to come up with a word two years ago at the launch when cybersecurity was becoming a much bigger issue with the, with the crossover between cybercrime and business economics. It may well be part of the course in the due course out of the business school because the old phrase is true and the videos have it earlier on. If you haven't been hacked, actually you have. It used to be the head of the FBI said, if you haven't been hacked, there's a 50% chance you will be. Now that statement is if you haven't been hacked in some way, you have. I've had my LinkedIn profile stolen, I've had people spoof emails into the company, I've had some of my employees almost send out checks for 10,000, 7,000, you know, that's not an invitation to go send in requests for checks, but what we've had is there's persistent attacks because of people see me and they come in and try and spoof my LinkedIn profile, they attack my accounts, and I'm old enough to have a Yahoo account, so that's probably a sign of age and I still have a Yahoo email account. Um, but Cybersecurity is still very under, should we say, underappreciated by a lot of SME companies. They don't believe it's going to happen to them. And typically they don't find out they've been attacked for about five or six months after the fact. And the type of thing we're doing is location-based data. So on the top left, those of you from Galway or thinking about the Roisin Dove and other pubs, we're able to monitor where people started off their journey and where they ended up. So who got off the bus in Air Square and how long it took them to get to the Roisin Dove for a pint? Right. And we can see how people move. I just took snapshots at different times of the day. And that one on the right hand side is people in the top right hand corner, those black dots, are people who get off a bus in Air Square. And then some of those dots start to appear down at the bottom left, which is in the pub. So you're starting to capture this level of information about who you are, where you go, when you drink, what shop did you stop at? Did you stop at a burger joint? Um, we gave some of this data to the Galway Chamber of Commerce. One simple thing, um, one of the major stores, Anthony Ryan's in Air Square, usually opened on a Sunday at one o'clock. Uh, we gave him the data and he realized that there was the same number of people walking past his store at 11 o'clock on a Sunday. So now they open at 11 o'clock. Um, there is McCambridge's coffee shop in Shop Street. There's the same number of people at 11 o'clock in the morning as at one o'clock. But it turns out the most profitable time to open up is two in the morning when everybody's coming out of the pub. So he said, go and sell burgers, you can probably make more money. But when people try to understand what is it you can do with this data, so what about big data analytics? It actually can be very, very useful from a commercial perspective in helping your business grow more, sell more, or in the case of smart cities, reducing some of the costs, using sensors and heat, uh, air conditioning, etc., to manage that more effectively. And then finally, um, in terms of this space, this slide, it's, some of you may have seen it before. It is very real. I'll give you an example of one of the projects we're involved in in the Middle East is uh, the organization had put in 200 smart ovens, ovens you can control with your phone, with your app. Somebody decided to disable the management platform to manage that app, which meant that anybody could access any of those ovens in a 200-bed apartment building. Now, if you think of Grenfell Tower and the fire, right, that's what I say, you have to think of absolute seriousness in cybersecurity and how you treat all of this big data. The more sensors you deploy, the more planes you can attack as in surfaces, surface threats are exposed. So you have to take it very, very seriously. So the issue of privacy, security, governance is absolutely mission critical. It has to be at the top level of a board agenda because the type of data that organizations like we have access to impacts you and impact people's lives. So that is something that is absolutely core and is what we do. 
And that uh, probably phrase that many of you have written papers about in business school is GDPR. I actually have a GDPR, which is, you can get digital, but with that comes personal ethical responsibility. And that's something for me is, just because you have all of this data, doesn't mean you have the right or the, the, the authority to go and abuse that data. With that power of access to people's information, you have huge responsibility to make sure that that data is secure and uh, there's privacy and governance around that. So that's really looking at three things. Uh, the, the tones, we've got industry, we're looking at uh, the future of work, which I view as very much a, a global space for us. And from a security perspective, the reality is you will get hacked, businesses will get attacked, your personal account will get attacked. Whether you're staying at a hotel or, or using a Gmail or something, at some point in time that data will be exposed. So just be prepared in terms of in your business life for that kind of threat and do everything you can to mitigate against it. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up and that's, that's me done. Okay, thank you.